Pascal and Jim, and um, I guess Kathy's connecting, but if there are, um, this is going to be Hi everyone, we'll get started uh, in about four minutes. Hello. Good evening, everyone. I'm Dr. Kanisha Zimmerman. On behalf of the ABC Science Collaborative, I'm really pleased to welcome you to the COVID-19 and the Classroom Series. Today, we are gonna be responding to questions that we've received from school teachers and staff. And um, we'd also love for you to include your questions um, in the chat function. Um, and we are very happy to try to answer those as we move along today. We'll have Dr. David Weber and Dr. Ibikun Akinboyo um, as our panelists. And as usual, Dr. Danny Benjamin will be um, my partner here in assisting to, to guide the session. Uh, Danny, I will turn it over to you. Great, right, thanks, Kanisha. Um, so just as a, a reminder, a friendly reminder, uh, the ABC 
uh, collaborative does not provide detailed advice on when or how schools uh, should open, uh, whether one goes to any particular uh, plan A, B, or C, uh, but rather uh, focus on the science or, uh, and safety. So thank you for joining. In prior webinars, we've had uh, a series of slides followed by Q&A. Tonight's session is a little bit different. Uh, we will try primarily to do questions that we haven't had time to do in prior webinars. We are also going to do questions that have come up uh, in board meetings uh, this past uh, week and a half, uh, whether it's at uh, ECPPS or uh, Orange or, uh, or Wake County Public School Systems. Um, and we will also generalizable to the broader community. We, uh, and uh, Kanisha, I'm hearing that I, there may be static um, coming through on mine. Um, do you mind if um, rather, uh, if you'll take the first uh, set of questions, maybe you and I can flip flop around um, uh, uh, masking and aerosolization. Um, anyway, please put your science related questions into the uh, into the chat and we'll take care of that for you and we'll try and pass along as many of these as we can. I'm going to turn it back over to Dr. Zimmerman with the next slide, please. Um, just so you're aware, um, to mark your attendance for viewing the YouTube live stream, there is a post webinar survey that you can fill out. Um, always also want to call attention to our new um, website. The link for that is listed at the bottom and we hope soon to have a QR code to be able to link to that um, more quickly. Next slide, please. So today, as Danny mentioned, um, we have a couple of topics we'd like to uh, take on. Um, we will be covering aerosolization and ventilation, surfaces, transmission and masks, testing, vaccine and timeline, flu and COVID-19, and um, some additional questions regarding um, special needs. So I will start uh, by, I'll start the conversation with Dr. David Weber um, and ask uh, him uh, a question about aerosolization and ventilation. So Dr. Weber, um, there have been, there's been a lot of recent data coming out um, about aerosolization um, as a mode of transmission for uh, the SARS-CoV-2 virus that causes COVID-19. Can you just tell us about the, um, the science regarding aerosolization and what that means for needing to change ventilation systems, perhaps in old schools? Uh, thank you. So uh, all the respiratory diseases that we're familiar with here in the United States that uh, we occur in the winter, influenza, RSV, parainfluenza, and the endemic coronaviruses, of which there are four, as well as COVID, are transmitted over short distances by aerosols. So when I talk, sneeze, cough, I expel particles. People breathe those in through their nose or mouth uh, and acquire infection. There are other mechanisms which we've talked about in the past, such as I rub my nose if I'm sick, touch an object, someone touches that, rubs their nose or mouth. Uh, and that is a, a potential means, but is much less important than that uh, direct droplet contact. We can debate how far it goes, but in general, being more than six feet away, certainly actually being more than three feet away, decreases your risk. If you go to six feet, it drops it even further. There have been some cases all indoors and in very confined uh, air spaces where there's been some evidence of transmission somewhat beyond six feet. An example will be on uh, a bus in Asia where uh, the windows uh, were closed. It was not well ventilated or air conditioned. People were in the bus for more than an hour and there was some evidence of transmission within the bus. It was a relatively small bus of eight or more, eight or nine feet. Similarly, there was an example in a restaurant that had an air conditioner blowing on a few people and some of the transmission might have been slightly more than six feet. But no one else at besides those two tables right in the wave of the air conditioning, none of the other 15 tables anyone became ill at. I had a colleague of mine that had an outbreak at her hospital where they were recycling, and, and there was a number of healthcare workers and patients exposed, but the air from that area was recycled to two other floors. No one else became ill on those other floors. 
an outbreak in a nursing home confined in one unit on the nursing home with lots of transmission to adjacent uh, units, but again, just physically connected, no transmission. So there is not good evidence of long distance transmission, meaning across a whole large room or from one room to another or from a room into a corridor, as we would see with uh, measles, chicken pox, and the old days with smallpox uh, there. So the bottom line is, uh, we'll talk more about that. Masks are protective. That's what protects you over this distance, and it protects you whether you're three feet away or five feet, uh, five feet away. It is reasonable to an extent possible to indoors, poorly ventilated places to increase ventilation. So if you can turn up and increase the ventilation, or if possible, open windows, that might be of help. No one's ever shown that. Uh, and certainly going to more extreme other measures like special machines that scrub the air uh, or uh, UV light filters that uh, kill uh, bacteria and bar viruses in the air ducts. One, there's no evidence any of that would be successful uh, in that case. And even just simple physical distancing, I'll give you one other example. The biggest risk in China was household transmission, not surprising, people close, not wearing masks. But even physically distancing within the household, meaning you try not to be in the same room with the person who is ill. This is a person you're living with, sharing bathrooms and undoubtedly passing at times, uh, decreased the rate of transmission in that in those households from 10% to 3%, just physically distancing with no mask use in a house. Again, suggests to me relatively short uh, distances uh, and the need predominantly uh, for wearing masks, which is the main mode, main way we're gonna prevent transmission. So David and uh, Eva, can I've got some follow-up questions, but to just do a mic check very quickly. Um, Kanisha, is that better? Can you give me a, a thumbs up or Oh, maybe not better. It was better for a second. I think it might be. Yeah, it might be uh, internet. Do you want to? Uh, oh, we're good here. Okay. So um, uh, let's see. So uh, Eva, can maybe just to give uh, to get a little bit of follow up on that, if you could um, outline. Um, yesterday I was at, uh, or maybe Monday night I was at Orange County Schools. Uh, outline for us kind of the difference between uh, R naught uh, for uh, the respiratory viruses and uh, say measles and kind of what the implications are uh, for that as it relates to long distance spread. Yes, I, I can. I, and I will try my best to ensure we don't go too far into some of the statistics here. But what you're referring to, which I think a lot of people have seen, is this concept of r naught, which is how quickly you could imagine a pathogen would spread. And it's a calculated number that has to do with the type of pathogen it is. So pathogen, it could be bacteria, it could be vir uh, virus. In this context, we're focusing a lot on viruses. It could be the spacing, it could be the number of people that are susceptible. So what that means is if you have a vaccine preventable illness, how you calculate the R0 will change. In theory, you can assume that if you have this reproduction number of one, you are most likely transmitting in your community. So what that means is if you bring someone that has that infection into a closed group where no one has ever been infected, no one is protected, at the very least, one other person would definitely be infected if they're exposed. As that number goes up, you can spread faster. So if you have an R0 of two, or three, it's not quite as specific as that because imagine you have one additional person, that person can now spread to an additional person, but that original person is still spreading. So this is how it becomes exponential growth when you bring an infection into a community. Typically, when we see quick spread in a community, say, for example, we've talked about measles, going back to the days where people talked about amusement parks, when you go in with one infected person, how quickly you can have a measles outbreak. We're talking about R0 numbers that are reaching, nearly reaching the double digits. Um, when you're thinking about something like influenza, you're thinking of an R naught that's closer to one, so it can spread, and you can have one person spread to someone else in the classroom, maybe even on that person spread to another person, but you're not seeing a cluster of five, 10 people in a short period. With COVID-19 in the beginning, 
we didn't know enough about this virus. It was hard to calculate what was going on around this or how quickly it was spreading. And if it's only based on symptoms versus those that are asymptomatic. We've learned a lot more. And we've expected, I think we've mostly calculated that the R naught is about 2.5 to 4. And so there have been a few studies that look at prior data and suggest that the R naught was a lot higher. And that makes sense. It, it probably was spreading a lot faster earlier on prior to a lot of our preventive strategies. But as we've looked over time, the R naught is pretty consistent. So it, it spreads faster than influenza. It's higher than influenza in terms of the R0, but it's not as high as something like measles that tends to be airborne transmission. So it can cover long distances and potentially infect a lot more people in a room. There are a lot of numbers in there. There are a lot of calculations in there. And there are a number of things that affect the R0, but I try not to focus too much on a specific number just to understand the range and that this spreads faster than some illnesses and not as fast as others. Great. I'm going to take a couple of questions then. Um, this one, maybe I'll kick over to David. Is there an increased risk in schools where the HVAC systems are having issues? So the answer, uh, again, the ma uh, again, I just want to stress masks are protective regardless of the ventilation. That's been uh, repeatedly, uh, repeatedly shown. We don't really know uh, uh, what, if any, additional risk would be if you used, let's say, uh, your filter was 25% instead of 35% efficient, or if you had the average house has about 0.4 to 0.6 air exchanges an hour, meaning it takes about two hours for all your air in your house to be exchanged for fresh air. Uh, most uh, commercial building schools are in the range of uh, uh, two to four air exchanges. Our hospital rooms are about uh, six, but we really don't know what the additional protection would be using six air exchanges versus uh, one air exchange. What we do know is wearing masks are protective uh, there. Now, the more air exchanges and the fresh air you mix in, uh, the uh, 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 better it is. And there is certainly evidence on airplanes where there have been outbreaks on airplanes, uh, but I should say, in general, those show transmission only within people one or two rows away at most uh, from everybody else, suggesting distance does matter and uh, that air exchanges alone are not sufficient uh, without people wearing masks because airplanes have lots of fresh air, uh, much more than we would have in an average commercial building uh, uh, available, and yet it doesn't prevent it uh, there. So I don't really know that just using more air exchanges would be uh, uh, preventive, but masks will work. Danny, we can't hear you, so you need to unmute yourself if you're talking. Thank you, David. I'm having I'm having considerable challenges today. Thank you. Most of them self-inflicted, I'm sure. Um, the and this is along the same lines. Would an air purifier be a wise purchase, um, especially in close proximity to others and I take it from your prior answers, um, you know, a ma a, a, use a mask and if um, an uh, air purifier, probably not much additional uh, protection above that. So I have, yeah, there are really two caveats with that. One would be if one chose to open windows in a school and you have children with allergies in those rooms, uh, that is going to let all the allergens outside into the, the room. An air purifier to help remove the pollen and things might be useful. And my wife, who has allergies, we certainly have uh, uh, air purifiers. And I'm not talking about big professional air purifiers. I'm talking about what's called a HEPA filter, a high efficiency particle filter. And you can actually buy these at places like Walmart and Target uh, and, and others. And the one specific place that the CDC recommends would be in a small confined nurse's office where you would actually be presumably putting sick children who would be waiting transport uh, to uh, be picked up by their parents uh, and need to go home and who, because they're ill, may or may not be able to wear a mask. So that is the one uh, place in the school uh, that it is recommended. There is no recommendation for such uh, filters in college classrooms or high school K through 12 classrooms in general. Great. Thank you. So 
Dr. Zimmerman, I think you're up with uh, surfaces, if you'd like to uh, take over for a while. Sure, I'll pull one from the chat um, that I saw. Uh, I've been seeing and hearing about companies going into buildings and spraying disinfectant to assist in keeping down the spread. What are your feelings on this service and is it effective? Dr. Akinboye, would you mind taking that question? I don't mind. It depends on what exactly they're spraying. I think we've discussed cleaning and disinfecting in some of our prior webinars. And what we emphasize and what we are going to continue to discuss is the fact that whatever you're using to clean a surface should have some level of disinfection um, or the disinfectant in it. And all that means is it's able to remove the bacterial or viral, or viral burden from a surface. So if there's visible dirt, you can just clean it with a wet, wet cloth. But if you're trying to kill off bacteria, viruses, most common household disinfectants can have been approved for routine cleaning. If you're cleaning a large surface, so a large a school that has multiple rooms or a large auditorium, it may make some sense to have a larger device that can spray a disinfectant on multiple surfaces. And you need to allow time for it to dry because that's when sort of the disinfecting properties can occur. Again, I can't speak to a specific practice. There are many ways of applying a disinfectant. You can wipe, you can spray, as long as you follow the manufacturer's recommendation, recommendations and you, are, you have confirmed that whatever product is being used is approved and can actually remove living organisms from the surface you're cleaning, I think it should be more than sufficient. Thank you very much. Um, Dr. Weber, can you maybe speak a little bit to um, the transmission that actually occurs with regard to surfaces? Say that again, I missed uh, a word or two in there. Transmission from surfaces? What oh, is yeah. the evidence? So there is quite a bit of evidence for transmission for other respiratory viruses, and that includes animal models, uh, putting an animal that's sick into a cage, taking it out, and then putting another animal in the cage. There is evidence for humans where you actually would give someone a viral infection, a mild one like a common cold, and what you they would do is rub their nose put on a mask, go into a room, rub the table and leave. Somebody else would go in there with a mask on, rub the table, leave the room, rub their nose and acquire disease. It's been hard to prove with COVID uh, because we're almost always within six feet of people. Uh, we know the virus survives on the surface uh, for a period of time, meaning uh, uh, hours, but really proving a transmission has been hard. There are two cases I'm aware of where there was transmission in apartment building in one case and a mall in the other. People who had never met each other were getting sick. And uh, that was linked to using common elevators and presumably touching uh, elevator uh, buttons. And one outbreak on an airplane where everybody was masked except when they went to the restroom and some transmission touching things. And I should say here, uh, we do not think that this virus is transmitted in stool and by aerosolizing stool. So yes, there may be some risk by uh, common uh, uh, transmission by common uh, environmental objects between people. And so the general guideline is for shared objects that we use in the hospital, like blood pressure cups in schools, like pens would be if possible to disinfect them between uses by different people. Thank you. And Dr. Akinboyo, you mentioned, or we talked some about kind of the spraying process of disinfectants. And um, we've gotten some questions before about whether or not there's anything magical about spraying in and of itself so that perhaps it cleans the air. Can you comment on that? Uh, I can. I, I think the we don't expect this viruses to necessarily live in the air. So it can spread through air, but they usually drop at some point. And so that's why the concern has been about surfaces and not necessarily spraying to disinfect the air. So the goal here is to ensure that you're focusing on surfaces around and for purifying, or I guess somewhat keeping the virus down in a closed space is more about 
reducing the number of people. If you can, if it's practical in some settings, certainly having things outdoors as compared to indoors and then everyone masking will reduce the number of viruses that are floating around. But I would not necessarily focus on spraying to remove viruses from the air. I do would like to make a quick comment about spraying versus uh, uh, using a disinfectant wipe or uh, that. We've looked at this in, in the laboratory. Uh, you remove bacteria viruses from a surface in one of two ways. One, you can just physically remove it, just rub it off with soap and water. The other is you can use a disinfectant. If you're using a disinfectant, something the chemical itself uh, kills, like alcohol, for instance, very effective uh, both for surfaces as well as for uh, hands, uh, it doesn't matter how you apply it. You can uh, put it on as a liquid, you can spray it on, you can put it on with a cloth. As long as the alcohol has 10 seconds of contact with the COVID virus, it will kill it. Doesn't matter how it gets there, uh, provided you're using a chemical. If you're not using a chemical like soap and water, then it's just physical removal. And in fact, if you rub the surface with just, say, a towel and water, you can throw it away and they will remove some of the virus. But if you took that towel and rubbed one surface and went into another room and rubbed the surface, you're actually just going to transfer the virus from one place to the other. So if you're not using a disinfectant, you want to throw whatever you're using to wipe the surface away. Thanks very much. And then maybe, David, one more question from the chat regarding this. Um, is there is there a risk of over disinfecting? So the answer is no. There really is no risk of over disinfecting. Uh, once the disinfectant evaporates, the bacteria uh, um, come back, uh, grow back up. We live in a sea of bugs. You really can't over disinfect. I should say, though, we do need to be sensitive that uh, some people who have lots of allergies can be sensitive when you spray these. The spray itself, if, if it comes in a spray, it's not uh, harmful. But in some people who are very allergenic and very sensitive, it can precipitate uh, coughing, sneezing, and asthma-like conditions. So uh, you really don't want to spray this into people's faces and get it on their mucous membranes. And just be aware of that uh, if the people nearby are coughing or sneezing, that it might be due to the spray. Thanks so much. Dr. Benjamin, maybe transm transmission and masks? Great, right. thank you, Dr. Zimmerman. Um, so the first one, I think, uh, Ibikin, uh I've had this question in the chat uh, multiple times. It's about getting the virus multiple times. Given the symmetry of that, I think I'll ask you, uh, what are the chances of, require, of acquiring the virus uh, two or more times? It's a very specific question, which I appreciate. I think we we don't know the number. What we do know is we're starting to see some cases of reinfection. We, there, as far as I know, there's been no documented case in a child yet, but it's not impossible that, that it could happen. And what we've seen is that maybe some people that got infected early in the course of the pandemic, for example, in March, um, and definitely had documented COVID-19, they had a test that confirmed it, they had symptoms, they had an exposure, all of those things seemed to fit. They got better, and some may have even had some tests in between that were negative, and then had another exposure, and unfortunately acquired COVID-19 again. When they compare the viruses, they're just different enough that it's not the same virus from March that's still shedding all the way through to, say, May or August. Um, it clearly was a different virus. So what does that mean for us? I think it's not just that, can it happen again? I think some of us have been, we've been suspicious of the fact that this may be like a lot of other respiratory viruses where you can get it again, um, but is there some relative immunity to some people, um, for some people that would prevent them from reacquiring this infection? And I think this goes back to answers other people have provided that we can't use herd immunity as a strategy to get rid of this because reinfections are possible. And of course, sometimes with reinfections, it may mean a milder illness, but there've been, there's been at least one case where it was actually a more severe illness. So reinfections are possible. We don't have the numbers yet. It doesn't seem to be a lot of people. There've been millions of people infected. Um, at least locally, we've only seen a small number of cases of true reinfections. Okay, great. I think um, I'm gonna 
I'll come back to you for this one here. It's commonly been said that masks prevent the spread from an infected person to someone who is uninfected. Mm -hmm. uh, that commonly said, that's correct, because it's correct. Um, do you, do masks provide protection to the uninfected person who is wearing a mask? So if I'm wearing the mask and I'm not infected, does that improve my chances? I think number one. And uh, this question uh, came up also more than once. And from the from the framing of the other time that it was uh, asked, am I uh, potentially gonna have a less severe disease uh, uh, if I'm wearing a mask, if I do acquire uh, the, the virus? Okay, I would rather we don't have people acquiring the virus, which I think is what the mask is. The goal here with masking is that it will protect you from getting it. But let me break down that question to make sure I understand. I think the question is, who does the mask protect? So if I have COVID-19 and I'm wearing a mask, am I protected and what am I protected from? So I think if you've already acquired it, prefer, we would prefer that you're either in a clinical setting receiving care or you're isolating at home um, because that would limit the spread. Of course, if you're in a household with multiple people, there are many ways to see if you can separate, if that household is unable to separate out. So have some physical distancing in different rooms, potentially having everyone in the house wear a mask. So if you already have COVID-19 and you're wearing a mask, are you protected in that context? It, it may not make as much sense because you already have COVID-19, but you are protecting everyone around you from getting it. And in tandem, if I don't have COVID-19 and I'm wearing a mask, then potentially um, I'm, it's a sort of bi-directional in that context where I'm protected from getting it from someone who is infected. And the, the, the important point here is I'm describing two people that you know for a fact you don't have it or you know for a fact that you do. But the difficulty with COVID-19 has been that we have people that don't know that they have it and are going about their regular life. And that's because you may have been exposed either knowingly or, or unknowingly um, and you're asymptomatic. And so in that specific situation where you have two people without symptoms interacting, it's better that both people are wearing a mask because you protect the person that has no symptoms, not infected um, from getting it from you who you don't know that you have an infection and potentially you may be interacting as normal. So I guess, who does a mask protect? It really protects everyone. It protects those that are close to you. It protects those that you may not know um, and it protects you as well as you're going about your regular life. Great, thanks. And then as a follow-up to that, and. I think this was maybe a uh, lack of clarity on my part in asking the question. If, if you think in terms of viral burden or viral load, if I am uninfected and I am wearing a mask, will the mask help me in the sense that maybe I get less of a viral load if I come in contact with somebody else and therefore maybe I get less severe disease? I can answer that. Yeah. Uh, so I think there, there are a couple of issues. One is we have an inoculating dose. So one virus doesn't cause infection. So by wearing a mask, you may reduce from uh, getting infection to no infection by not getting enough viruses to cause any infection. And there is some evidence that if you get exposed to a very large amount of virus, you get sick faster and have a worse course. So yes, even if you get sick, by reducing the amount of virus you inhaled, you may mean that you uh, take a little longer to get ill and don't get quite as ill. There is some evidence to support that. Yeah, and to add to that, I think earlier on, so we had questioned why we're seeing such severe illnesses in healthcare workers. And there was this question about potentially a dose effect, where they were getting such a large inoculation, I should say, large inoculation of the virus, so larger amounts of viral particles. Um, so yes, getting a lower um, amount would probably be helpful. Not getting at all, actually, would be the goal. Great, thank you. Um, <clears throat> and then I know as a um, Follow-up uh, question around masking. Uh, UNC Chapel Hill has done a fair amount of uh, research on this topic. Um, the R 
uh, cotton, uh, thick cotton mass as effective as uh, medical or surgical mass. Um, and uh, please differentiate between N95 mass and medical mass. And then uh, the question on uh, many uh, young uh, athletes minds, uh, what about gators? Uh, so David, if you could uh, take all three of those, because uh, I know that there's been considerable work at UNC on this uh, active research topic. Certainly. So an N95, by definition, uh, filters out 95% of particles that we would cough out that would carry a virus or a bacteria. They work better for two reasons. One, the filtering capacity through the mask is better, but probably even more important, they just fit tighter around the face. So unlike a homemade mask or a medical mask, they, which just come in one size, these come in small, medium, and large, and often times extra large, and you actually have to be specifically tested to fit one, and we actually find people where they don't fit any of the sizes available from one manufacturer, and we move them to another uh, manufacturer. That said and done, the evidence does not suggest uh, that uh, 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 the, even though the medical mask is not as efficient, it still provides sufficient uh, uh, filtering uh, to prevent infection, and it's been very hard, if not impossible, uh, when you do studies to actually show uh, that one is actually superior uh, to the other. In our hands, a properly fitted uh, homemade mask with a uh, multiple layers in it works just as well as a medical mask. Uh, you can see here, I'll just hold up for you, a little device here uh, in front of my camera. So this uh, is a, one of the things that one can simply do with any mask is, I'll put my mask on. So this fits behind my head and just pulls the mask tighter. You don't have to do anything fancy like my little piece. You can just use a hair clip or a little, uh, 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 even a uh, large safety pin. So if you can pull a tighter fit, that actually has, it makes it more comfortable. It doesn't fit behind the ears and it improves the, the tightness. But the bottom line was gaiters, when properly made, worked as well for us as medical masks and as many homemade masks as well. The only difference I would say is unlike a medical mask, when you go in and buy it, whether you buy it at the local pharmacy or uh, you go into Walmart and buy a mask, it meets certain standards, and that's true for an N95. The problem with homemade masks, if you just buy one from somebody uh, or make it yourself, there isn't any standard test, even if you bought it uh, in a store, that uh, it has to meet. So, again, you want something that fits tight around the face, ideally crimps over the nose, goes under the chin, very important to cover the nose and the mouth. Keep in mind, the virus lives perfectly well just in the nose and has an adequate thickness, not so you have any problems breathing, but an adequate thickness. Great, and uh, you, uh, my audio may have cut out, so you may not have addressed, you may have addressed this, but uh, did you comment on uh, efficacy of uh, gators? Gators in our hands uh, worked when properly uh, made just as well, by the way, uh, as a medical mask and as other homemade devices. Great, thank you. Um, so uh, there was a, uh, another question around uh, if I'm storing, uh, how should I store my mask either uh, overnight or when eating? Uh, uh, Eva, can will you take on that one? Yes. So, assuming this is a cloth face mask, and typically we're encouraging people to use it once, so when you go out or during your school day, and at the end of that day, so overnight, hopefully you're putting it in whatever place you put your dirty laundry so it can be washed prior to being reused. For, I work in the hospital and for us, we use our, the surgical face mask. And I know some teachers, some staff may be using the surgical face mask, or even when you're using a cloth face mask during the course of the day and you'd like to take it off. If you can, um, I guess it's probably easier if we just show. So I have a face mask here that I use when I come to work and the blue side is considered the, the side that faces the outside world and just kind of folding it onto itself if, you, if your mask allows for that and placing it on a clean surface. We do have paper bags in our hospital. That's a choice we've made here, but 
some people, if you just have a clean napkin of some sort that you can hand out or even a tissue paper. So it's just on a surface and not right on the desk or where people are eating. And then keeping that mask break as short as feasible and putting it right back on. Also important to wash hands before and after you manipulate the mask and encourage the kids to wash their hands before and after touching their mask. Great, uh, thank you. Uh, Kanisha, I think we're gonna go back over to you for uh, testing. Sure, I just wanted to ask Dr. Akinboyo if we can, a quick question about when people are considered infectious after being exposed and how long they might be infectious. Yeah, that's a great question. And I don't know that we've talked, we've targeted that point as much during some of our webinars, um, particularly for kids and um, having to stay out of school. When do you come back? When do you get tested? So typically for viruses or for most, for some for pathogens, we think about what we call the incubation period. So say you get exposed today and you get tested right now, you get tested today, the value of that test may not be high because it doesn't even allow the virus to incubate and then either show symptoms or lead to an infection. For COVID-19, SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes COVID-19, there's an estimated incubation period that puts you at a, just about five days. So if you do get an infection, if you get tested at five to seven days after your exposure, you are more likely to capture that infection and find that positive test than if you get tested on day one. Now, how does that play into quarantine and isolation and things like that? It may be a little difficult to time it all out, uh, but for our practices here, we've recommended that if you do have a child with this, or even an adult with a documented exposure um, and they remain asymptomatic, they should get tested about day five to seven. If you have symptoms after an exposure, you can get tested immediately. Thank you, that's really helpful. Um, all right, I think there was uh, a question about testing. Let's see if I can find it. Um, Dr. Weber, can you talk to me about um, testing um, the utility of testing um, once before people come back to school, is that something that people are thinking about or something that is helpful? So uh, let me first say about uh, testing. Uh, if we are within the incubation period, you just heard up to 14 days and you've had exposure uh, to somebody uh, without, you were not wearing a mask, they were not uh, within six feet, whether they're, if they were infected, symptomatic or asymptomatic, you are at risk for developing COVID. So a negative test today doesn't mean that you won't get sick tomorrow. So that's the first thing to realize. Certainly uh, uh, testing before people come back to school has been, uh, was not initially advocated by the CDC, but it's something many colleges and universities will think about uh, for next semester. Because again, it's different than K through 12. We're bringing in hundreds or thousands in many cases of students who live in a dorm like big houses. And you don't want people living in close proximity when they can't wear a mask because they're in groups essentially uh, like, as I said, large houses. And in that case, testing before people come uh, might make sense so they wouldn't come and you would fill your dorms with people who are largely uninfected. Testing people before coming to K through 12, where they're living in households and not having transmission in that household has not been recommended uh, and uh, 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 really has not been studied as a way of prevention. You certainly do not want people, whether they're uh, students or uh, staff members at the uh, school or teachers coming to uh, a school if they're sick, if they have respiratory symptoms that suggest uh, COVID, they need to stay home and call their primary medical provider, and if indicated, as it usually would be, but not always, to be uh, uh, be tested. But uh, uh, testing people before they began K through 12 schools has not been recommended uh, uh, because uh, they should be limited transmission of people are in home and following uh, social distancing plus uh, wearing a mask. Um, and then before moving off that testing point, uh, and David alluded to this a little bit, I just want to point out that 
for most recommendations around testing while you're in quarantine. So you get exposed, you're supposed to be in quarantine for about 14 days. Even if you get tested at day seven and it's negative, my understanding is that does not shorten your quarantine because you, we still expect that the, since you could potentially still get infected day 13 or day 14, most people still have to stay out of that setting for 14 days. The simple way to remember it is you can't test your way out of your isolation period. Thanks to both of you. Um, one que question for Dr. Weber about the, the test. Let's assume that um, we want to get to a point of being able to test. Can you tell us about the possibilities of um, testing yourself or at home testing or where are we with that? We've seen a lot of stuff in the news. So there are more than 200 uh, tests that have now been approved by the FDA. They're using what they call an emergency use authorization, an EUA. So those tests may not have been fully studied and uh, there are several aspects about a test that we need to consider. If I'm sick, does it tell me I'm sick? So how often is it sensitive or right? If I'm not sick, how often does it tell me I'm not sick uh, is also uh, another important. How fast is the result? And can the test, because people who don't have symptoms have lower viral load, can it pick up people who are not sick and but still infectious? So we have more and more tests, and uh, uh, hopefully uh, those tests will become less expensive, easier to use. Uh, right now, the gold standard is a swab to the back, through the nose, to the back of the throat. People are looking at just uh, swabs just at the early, uh, beginning part of the nose, in the mouth, and even saliva. Those are not quite as sensitive, but uh, that's being studied and being improved. And ideally, we would like to have tests that don't require the test itself to be sent off to a laboratory that people could uh, do themselves. I think we will have more and more such tests. I think the testing ability of accuracy will get better. And I think we will ultimately be able to use body fluids other than a swab to the back of the nose. Uh, can we get those tests to be uh, so inexpensive they can be wi uh, widely used is another uh, issue. And when you look at the people who have actually just studied this mathematically, if you really want to be sure that a nursing home, uh, as an example, or a cruise ship or an airplane, uh, long flights or things that you'd be longer on, more like a cruise ship, or a school is really safe, you really have to test people two or three times a week, particularly if they continue to go out in public and not practice physical distancing and masks. So uh, if we go to a, a system where Nobody, some states have, they like Florida, anybody can do anything and people are, are, are not required to wear a mask. Testing only works to protect a school or a cruise ship if you're willing to do it three times a week, uh, which is an enormous financial and logistic burden. And I don't know how practical that would be. Uh, but if people want to uh, are worried because they went to uh, some type of protest or uh, they were in the supermarket and stood in line next to somebody without a mask. I think we will have at some time in the future, uh, near future, home kits that would allow you to do your testing at home that are maybe not as good as what we'd use if you were sick and came into the emergency department, but still would be quite good. Thank you. Uh, Danny, maybe let's move on to vaccine and timeline. Great, thanks. Um, so uh, let's kind of walk through a timeline and, and maybe what needs to be done. Um, what is between uh, us now, uh, Ibakan, and an emergency use authorization for a vaccine? Um, how many vaccine candidates do we have in the pipeline? Um, the leading candidates, uh, how? Uh, what, what more testing needs to be done to say the top three or four leading candidates coming through the pipeline? What gets them between October 1st and, uh, and, a, and an EUA, if you will, emergency use authorization? 
Yeah, so we had a great web webinar that included some, a brief discussion by Dr. Michael Smith about vaccines and timelines and some of the ones that are in the pipeline. Um, I, and I know some of those have talked about it in other formats, but I'm going to focus on, I'm going to assume you also mean pediatric inclusion in some of these trials. Um, I think we can be optimistic that if a potential vaccine candidate will be available on the market and in the United States sometime this winter, maybe early 2021. That being said, and I think to clarify for everyone, the parts of the vaccine production process that's being sped up tends to be more about manufacturing and distribution. A lot of companies have publicly stated and a lot of scientists that are involved in the vaccine trials have continued to follow the safety protocols to ensure that whatever product actually comes on the market is a safe and effective product. But that being said, this is also a timeline that's faster than anything else that's been produced before. And so say in January 2021 and, and maybe somewhat optimistic in our current setting. Regardless of when that initial vaccine candidate comes out, pediatrics and so for children, um, we tend to have vaccines that target children much later. And that timeline may be going into 2022 at this rate. Sometimes we can use data that, uh, from studies that have been conducted in adults to extrapolate to children and assume some safety and maybe efficacy so that it would still work in kids. but dedicated trials still have to occur and those also take time. So I'm anticipating that maybe by 2022, maybe end of 2021, um, we would have vac COVID-19 vaccines, just to be clear. I know there've been questions about flu vaccines, but COVID-19 vaccines that are available for kids as well. There are others in the chat today that may be able to weigh in on other perspectives on vaccines as well. Great, I, I know that that involves a considerable uh, amount of uh, guesswork on 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 your part. I think um, uh, you know there are a lot of key questions about whether whether it's late 2021 for children or 2022 or even 2023 before uh, children actually uh, get a vaccine. Um, Dr. Uh, Weber, uh, would you? Um, want to give um, a perspective uh, here as well? Uh, certainly. So I should say, I think uh, we'll have a number of vaccines out. Uh, a vaccine is likely to work. It's unlikely to be a true home run, I think, initially, meaning like the measles vaccine, more than 95% effective. Uh, we have already begun planning at UNC for how to uh, implement and deliver uh, such a vaccine. Uh, the day the vaccine gets licensed, we won't have supply for 360 million Americans. The government will uh, provide some guidance on who we should focus those vaccines on. So we have a group of pharmacists, vaccine experts uh, to help us uh, begin thinking about the implementation. And, and it's sort of uh, the devil's in the details. We need to order special freezers. Many of these had to be uh, stored at a frozen temperature. Uh, and I should say our discussion uh, includes experts in both diversity uh, and in ethics, since uh, as we deliver those vaccines, we want to make sure they're equally available to all segments of our society uh, for whom those vaccines would benefit. And we want to make sure if we have shortages that we are being transparent uh, and ethical in how we use and distribute uh, uh, those, uh, uh, those vaccines. But the goal is, should a vaccine in the near future be released, we've solved all the implementation and delivery issues uh, uh, on that. And we're working closely with our colleagues and our, for us in uh, Chapel Hill, Orange County Public Health Department uh, in, in, in that planning. Great, David, thank you for that. Um, and then when we, uh, Think about uh, the efficacy of a vaccine, David. You mentioned, you know, not a home run. Um, walk us through, if you would, your uh, perspective on um, what are we kind of most likely looking at here. Uh, I realize that at one end of the spectrum, you know, we have 140 candidates. So it's possible to get a home run, but uh, what, what's what's the most likely? 
scenario? So if you look at uh, what they, they, they do what they call a power analysis, how many people do you have to put in a trial to achieve a certain effectiveness? And those trials are powered to show a vaccine that is 50% uh, uh, effective. Now, that may seem terrible. It only uh, uh, protects 50% of people. Uh, but keep in, uh, in mind, we've had 200,000 people die. And if we had a safe and effective vaccine that everyone had and had taken, that would have reduced that by at least half. So we're saving, just as with flu vaccine, millions of illnesses and, and hundreds of thousands of deaths. And so that is sort of the bottom line that we're looking for is 50 percent. Obviously, more is better, and we'd love to get a vaccine that's about uh, uh, 70 percent uh, effective. And we will know, you know, in the next several months, I think, uh, somewhere in two to six month range, whether we have a vaccine that achieves at least that 50 percent and is safe in the short run, meaning people don't get severe fevers or illnesses or have other medical problems with the vaccine. But I need to tell you, there are many things we're not going to know when that va first vaccine gets released. We are not going to know how long it protects people. Uh, we may ha know that it protects them for several months. And if we wait long enough, we'll know that it protects them for a year. But we won't know whether it protects them for three, four, or five years. And we won't know when that first vaccine is released whether we need to get a shot each year like a, like a flu shot. Uh, we won't know because this vaccine will not initially be tried in children, pregnant women, people with underlying medical problems like cancer. We won't know if it works in those groups of people, and we won't know if it's safe for those groups of people. Uh, so we do need to keep in mind uh, that, um, uh, that there are some things we will know and some things we won't. And there are over 100 vaccines in trials. And the goal is to find a vaccine that's reasonably good to find is more than 50 percent and continue to push on vaccines until we develop a vaccine that's very good. And we've done this with other vaccines. The first vaccine for shingles, uh, uh, a vaccine was only 50 percent good. And we used that for many years. And now we have a vaccine that's 95 percent uh, effective. So we will continue, even if the first one's not a home run, we will continue working on new vaccines, just like we continue working on new therapies. We have a drug called remdesivir. It's good, but it's not a home run. And we continue to work hard to develop even better, safer, cheaper drugs. Great. So um, I'm just going to summarize a couple of key points. And then, um, Kanisha, I'm going to turn it uh, back over to you for um, whatever you decide to choose from for the last few questions because we're at uh, 6.53 at the moment. Uh, so um, we cannot, uh, as Ibukin earlier said, we cannot rely on uh, herd immunity uh, because of the potential for reinfection. So that may not, herd immunity may not be an optimal uh, strategy. Um, we cannot uh, rely on getting uh, a vaccine to children uh, uh, right away, uh, because first we have to get it into adults, uh, then we have to test it in children. Um, we not even sure if it's going to work uh, in children. Uh, if we do get it into children and it does work, we're looking at an uh, efficacy most likely around 50, 60 or 70 uh, percent if we get lucky. Um, and then we won't know uh, the length of time that it provides uh, protection, even if all children uh, get the vaccine. So um, for folks thinking about uh, COVID-19 and education, um, this is certainly going to be a story that's with us longer than 2020, uh, 2021, 2022, or 2023. Um, uh, Kanisha, uh, I'm going to uh, send it over to you for uh, the last few uh, questions. Sounds good. Thank you, Danny. I'm gonna just make this a hodgepodge because I saw some great questions within the within the chat. Um, so Dr. Akinboyo, can you just tell us um, about the preferred practice when we have kids who are sick in school um, and maybe multiple kids who are sick in school, should they be clustered together in that case? Yeah, good point. And I, we don't mean to sound so dismal, I think, <laughs> to just to clarify that we're sharing data that's currently available. And amidst all of that, we also have data to suggest how kids can be educated in a safe space and somewhat in person 
virtually as well, if that's what it calls for without leading to transmission. I know that's not what we're focusing on here today, but I just want to make sure that's also embedded in all of this and we have those resources and we share them. Um, and the reason I'm saying that is if you are, if you have to manage children that happen to get sick in a school setting, um, we can't forget all of the things that are related to protecting them in the classroom. So I wouldn't necessarily cohort them in a in a closed space and stop the six feet of distance. So and or remove their mask, except if they need to remove it due to shortness of breath. So as much as possible, if you're evaluating a child that's ill, it could be COVID, it could be something else. And so we don't want the space that is used for the evaluation to increase the risk for them acquiring it. So just keeping them separate as much as you can and encouraging a quick removal from the school setting when possible. Thank you. I'm gonna come right back at you with another question. Okay. Um, to children who are unable to mask, so children potentially with special needs, um, how can we, uh, are there some mitigation factors for teachers or staff who are caring for their, those children? Yeah, so we, we had a session on uh, exceptional children, children with special needs. And in that context, some of them may be able to wear masks and some of them may not. Some may be able to wear a face shield, so that could be the next step. And for those that cannot tolerate anything on their face at all or have increased secretion, so speeding, just saliva that you have to deal with or you have to come close to change diapers or give feeds. I think in that context, having enhanced PPE, so having enhanced protection, a surgical mask, a face shield, gowns and gloves, where possible um, would be helpful. All of this is in, if, if at all possible, we also have to encourage our families and our parents to monitor symptoms to ensure that these kids are relatively protected, they're in a bubble, and if they have a change in baseline, they're also not coming into a school setting, they're going to get evaluated or tested. Thank you. Dr. Weber, I'm gonna throw a question at you. Um, there is a lot of concern given that COVID-19 and the flu season are likely gonna be here together. Um, if you had a word of advice, could you, could you tell us how we might be able to stay calm in this particular situation? Well, I'll have two things to say. First, go get your flu shots. Flu shots work, and they're widely available through any of your local health care providers or at pharmacies in North Carolina and many other places. The second is uh, the very same things that protect you against COVID, protect you against influenza. We, there was a nice paper that uh, came out a couple of weeks ago and it looked at uh, uh, three uh, South, South Hemisphere countries where they've already had been having flu, uh, Australia, Chile, and uh, uh, South Africa, and there was much less flu because the same things work, wearing a mask, physical distancing, hand hygiene, and disinfection. And if we do that, you'll also protect yourself against flu. So those are the two take-home messages. Great, thanks very much. Um, there is a question in the chat about Ziploc bags and whether or not they are actually helpful in killing um, virus or bacteria. Um, and are they appropriate for holding your mask while you're eating or doing other things? I didn't assign that to anyone, <laughs> Dr. Akinpoyo. <laughs> So while they may be appropriate for holding the mask, just as a stopgap to have somewhere to place it, they do not, they are not effective in killing bacterial viruses. Thank you. And then um, one more rapid fire to Dr. Weber. So there is a question about the thickness of the, the thickness and the fit of the mask as opposed to the fabric. Can you speak to which one of those is actually effective? So the, uh, the, the most important part really is uh, how well it filters out small particles uh, like uh, in droplets. And that depends in part on the thickness, but not entirely. Uh, so the medical masks uh, we wear, the one you know I'm just holding up here, is not a very thick mask, but it was specifically designed, uh, the fabric, to filter out particles of the correct size. For non-medical masks, thickness does play a role in how well they work, but it's really uh, the tightness of the weave uh, of, the, uh, of the fabric. And you'll see in 
uh, many uh, masks, you'll also see a layer that almost feels silky or uh, plasticky, uh, which adds a little bit additional protection from the uh, part uh, of the mask that feels more like uh, cloth. But again, unless you're very knowledgeable about how it was actually made, uh, you really can't make a generalization about that. Thank you very much. I'm sorry for the rapid fire questions here at the end, but it is 7 p.m. Um, we've really enjoyed yeah. spending time with um, everyone on YouTube and uh, there are a lot of questions. So we will try to get to them over the next sessions um, or include them in our FAQs that will now be listed on our website. Um, so we're really, really excited to see you and hope to see you next week. Take care. Thank you.